can two opposite statements both be true at the same time? Things that are irreconcilable or even, shall we say, contradictory, can they both be true at the same time? And really, why does truth even matter? We're going to talk about this on today's program. We've got a very special interview with writer Paul Copan. A lot to talk about regarding truth and our relationship to it. Stay tuned. I've got a friend who's a writer, and we were talking about books and publishing. And a lot of people say, I want to write a book. And my friend in the publishing world, he said, people say they want to write a book, but what they really mean is they want to have written. It's like that with truth. People talk about truth, and yet really living by truth can be a, a, a real painful commitment. Sometimes we, we say we want there to be truth, but we exempt ourselves from it. Hi, Alex McFarland. I'm so honored that you're watching. And, you know, one of my favorite topics in the world of apologetics is the nature of truth. And truth is often defined as that which corresponds to reality. You may not realize this, but if you're like, you know, most normal human beings, you have a view of truth that is called the correspondence view of truth. Tr what is truth? We'll say, well, some say, well, it's my opinion or your opinion. No, truth is not merely subjective preference or assumption. What is really true, true truth, <laughs> shall we say, it's that which corresponds to reality. In other words, it's the way things truly are. If I said North Carolina is on the eastern seaboard of the, the North American continent, is that my opinion or is it reality? Well, you can get a globe. You say, my goodness, it's really reality. It's the way things are. Well, we're living in a time where truth is in crisis. I mean, like uh, a, 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 a Rocky movie, truth is on the mat, almost down for the count. And it is vitally important that we know what truth is and that we be able to defend it. Now, l let me just say this. I was talking earlier this week with a friend. He's a very famous sports writer. For 40 years, he's written for all of the major sports magazines. And we were talking. He's a devout Christian brother. He said, I'm getting out of publishing. He said, because the sports magazines are mandating that we who cover major sporting events, we have to use gender neutral pronouns. We can't say he or she. We have to say they, them. I said, you've got to be kidding me. He said, no, wokeness is infecting sports journalism. And this guy who's one of our nation's most esteemed sports writers, he said, I'm getting out of it, Alex. He didn't want me to use his name because uh, it's just very polarized right now. And so think about it, folks. When we no longer have the courage to say he ran the touchdown, she won the match. I mean, we're a culture that is cutting ourselves loose from truth and the consequences will continue to mount and the consequences will be dire. Now, why do you think that people, not all people, but many people in academia, in business, certainly in politics, why are people so uncomfortable with the idea of absolute truth? Well, they're uncomfortable with truth because truth points to the foundation of what's real, what's true, and that's God. I would submit to you, many people, they don't want there to be ultimate truth because that means there's the one who's revealed truth and I'm accountable to him and that's God. Well, when we come back, we've got an interview with one of the most significant intellectuals in the world right now, I believe. His name is Dr. Paul Copan. He's a defender of truth. 
So stay tuned. We'll converse with him when we return. This is John. He's 21. He's never met Jesus. It's possible he never will. He's already formed his beliefs. His heart is hard. He no longer believes God is good. How do you change his future? Let's go back in time to when John was a child. So let's find his public school and establish a Bible club down the hall. There, someone introduces him to Jesus, who takes his life in a new direction. John's so excited, he tells his friends, one of them comes to Christ. His mother sees the change in his life. When he asks to go to church, she comes too, and she comes to Christ. And it all began in a public school good news club. And this is how you change the future. Welcome back to the program. Well, we have an interview that you will not want to miss. This is something I've anticipated for a long time. We have with us now Paul Copan. He is a prolific author, a respected thinker and speaker, and really in the world of apologetics and biblical worldview and just absolutely effectively defending the Christian faith, uh, few people are doing as much and doing it as well as Paul Copan. He, for years, has been at Palm Beach Atlantic Christian University, and he holds the Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics, which is an endowed chair. And in the world of academics, this is really an accomplishment. And uh, he, he's worth it. I mean, I believe God has used Paul Copan in such great ways, and we're very honored to have him on right now. And we'll talk about a lot of important things, and not the least of which is the foundation of truth and how our, our culture is in such, I believe, a crisis of truth. Well, Paul, thanks for being with us today on the program, but most of all, thanks for what you're doing for God's kingdom and for our culture at large. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. And, and likewise. Well, uh, let, let's start. I want to go back. You've got so many books. And I know uh, current books in print, but I first became aware of you probably 20 years ago when you wrote a book with just one of the great book titles, True for You, But Not for Me. And I know that goes back a ways, but I, I want people to be aware of this. And uh, first of all, just let me ask this. What does that title mean? True for you, but not for me. Well, this is a common expression of relativism, that uh, truth or maybe morality uh, is uh, true or right for one person, but not for another, that it's relative depending upon maybe your time of history, your own individual preferences, your own culture. Uh, and so there is no objective truth. It is uh, truth that is the case whether even anyone believes it or not. Think about the earth being uh, round. Even if people believe the earth is flat, uh, everyone believes it's flat. Uh, that wouldn't change the truth of the matter that it is round. Uh, so that's what we're talking about, objective truth. It's not a matter of how I feel, what my opinion is, how sincere I am. Uh, truth has to do with objectivity. Uh, and what I'm doing in that book is defending the objectivity of truth. Uh, in the marketplace of ideas and pushing back against relativism when it comes to truth and morality. S since you first wrote that book, uh, Dr. Copan, uh, how has our culture's view of truth changed, I if indeed it has? And what do you think is the current assessment of truth in the Western world today? I think we've come to see that truth is mattering less and less. Uh, how a person feels, uh, what makes a person happy, stress-free, et cetera. These are the sorts of things that are uh, top shelf issues in our culture. And so truth, uh, you know, it can be a burden. Uh, and truth can be something that uh, you know may be difficult, for example, to defend as a Christian. Uh, if you're talking about Jesus is the only way, Jesus has the way, the truth, and the life, uh, there is an additional burden in a relativistic culture, uh, and the kind of pressure that is put on you because you're not falling in line with 
whatever is easiest, whatever is the uh, the path of least resistance. And so we're seeing more and more of that. And especially as we enter into the question of sexual preference, it's no longer a matter of your uh, how you're biologically constructed. Uh, it's a matter of how you feel inside. And even if that defies your bodily structure, uh, you know how you were made uh, as male or female, uh, that that you know that inner visceral uh, emotional subjective element uh, takes precedence and so that's you know and that has been a recent cascade effect uh, over the last few years I and mean, it's just come upon us like a storm and so we're we're seeing that kind of a radical shift uh, all the more uh, in recent days uh, you know as a philosopher and academic has it surprised you the degree to which the denial of truth has really pervaded our culture? I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing when, you know, uh, people in the ivory tower debate economic systems or does God exist? But I mean, w in the last year and a half, two years, we've watched th the denial of human biology, human physiology. And I, I mean, I know this is influencing the world of medicine. It's definitely influencing journalism and media. But has it surprised you that we really are seeing the, the enforced denial of truth? Yeah, there is a, a definite uh, concern here because it doesn't matter, and you think even in journalism, uh, where truth seems to be irrelevant, it's all, uh, you know, not all, but uh, but it's often a matter of um, ideolo ideological stances, uh, you know, partisanship, uh, that uh, there's no concern for objectivity anymore, even in reporting, that if something goes against the, uh, the preferred narrative, then it's obscured, it is uh, obfuscated, people will lie about it. And so it's, uh, you know, these are, these are, perilous times in which we're living. So whether it's in journalism or biology, medicine, uh, et cetera, we, we are seeing an assault on that. And, and a lot of people being intimidated into silence because it, it, it you know, you stick your neck out and uh, it will perhaps cost you your job or cost you your, your reputation and so forth. Uh, so there's, uh, that is the kind of uh, situation in which we find ourselves. And uh, even you know, whether it be, you know, you know, evangelical publishers or uh, or organizations, universities. Uh, there's an increased pressure and in, and in, in getting cowed into silence or perhaps uh, taking a woke position on, uh, on 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 a number of issues. So so we are seeing a rapid slide, a rapid decline uh, when it comes to upholding the truth and uh, ideology, uh, partisanship, and so forth. This seems to be more of what people are uh, siding with. Uh, this is, like I said, the path of least resistance, and um, and defenders of truth are finding it more and more difficult uh, to, uh, to make their point without being portrayed as uh, nasty, as arrogant, and bigoted, and so forth. Uh, what would you like to see happen in the lives of individual Christian believers to, to be prepared to stand for truth, to be equipped to analyze and accurately understand the culture and, and our place in it? Uh, Dr. Copan, what do you wish and, and seek for in the lives of individual believers? Well, of course, it's important to be doctrinally sound, uh, that uh, following the scriptures, following the teaching of Jesus, uh, that these are priorities for us in a in a day in which people are tossed to and fro uh, by every wind of doctrine, uh, being influenced by uh, Christ non Christian authors who sound uh, maybe appealing. Uh, they they may get some things right, but the the whole trajectory of what they're saying uh, is very misleading. Uh, but so truth and a doctrinal awareness is going to be very critical. 
Uh, but also, how do we present that? I think we ought to be careful not to present the truth in a way that uh, dismisses people, that is disrespectful. Uh, we speak the truth in love. We uh, defend the gospel with gentleness and respect. Uh, and so that's a second point, that as we defend the truth, we do so as winsome followers of Jesus. And then thirdly, I think our lives need to attest to the truth, that uh, we can't differentiate between uh, mere doctrinal truth as, as though that's all that matters, and then we can live however we want. Uh, we also need to have our lives matching up with the doctrine that we proclaim, uh, that there needs to be sound doctrine and sound living, as Paul talks about in uh, in his pastoral epistles. So those are some things that I think will be very important. And also, as culture declines, uh, we ought to be people of joy, people of hope, uh, people of integrity, uh, that these are what our culture is looking for, and uh, we need to stand out even if it seems like uh, there are many challenges to uh, the side that we represent, uh, to the truth, the one story that rules them all. And so these are these are some of my concerns and uh, priorities, and uh, may the Lord help us all as we strive forward to defend the, the gospel uh, with winsomeness and with integrity. Uh, how do you begin to dialogue with somebody who rejects the idea of truth? Uh, somebody who, whether they would know the word relativism or not, they're, they're right. steeped in relativism. How do you begin to open them up to the idea that truth exists? Well, I think one be the truth, uh, be the be the fifth gospel, so that they'll perhaps become curious about the four canonical gospels uh, that we in our lives ought to represent friendship, kindness, uh, a safe place for people to come to talk uh, to be with someone who is a loyal, faithful friend. And a lot of times it's in those crisis moments when it becomes quite apparent that relativism will not sustain you. Relativism uh, has no hold on reality. And so you are left without resources if you're a relativist. And so if you live that life of loving relationship, of living according to the truth, uh, people will will look you up. Uh, people will uh, will you know through friendship they will see you as someone who is trusted and will look to you in times of crisis, in times of uh, you know their own personal challenges. You know, would it be fair to say that um, as a Christian interacting with people around that some are believers, some aren't, lost people around? I mean, if we are personifying you know incarnational truth, then some at some point people will be open to doctrinal truth. Is that fair to say? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that there there is a, uh, you know, again, we need to speak the truth in love, and sometimes it's the love that is, of course, it's not as though love and truth are opposed. Uh, yeah, and but but I think when we, as Jesus said, by this all will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. So within the Christian community, uh, but also with others to love God and to love others, uh, that this is going to be a pathway forward for people to, you know, as we're following the way, the truth, and the life, uh, for them to become more curious about uh, who this Jesus is, we're, that we're whom we're representing. Uh, so yes, that is, I think, the the appropriate uh, pathway to uh, to live out the truth, uh, to speak the truth where we can, and to invite them. Uh, through relationship, through being a good listener and so forth, to uh, to uh, pu push them toward considering the truth of Jesus Christ very seriously. Well, let's talk about words for a moment, because as you and I agree, words have meaning. And uh, uh, it's not uh, just your interpretation. I believe you wrote a book of that title, didn't you? That's just Indeed. your interpretation. So uh, I was just this past weekend in Mississippi talking to college students from Mississippi State. And when it comes down to some of the, the black and white realities of Scripture, Jesus is the risen Son of God. We're saved through faith in Jesus. And students will play the card. Well, that's just your interpretation. How do you begin to respond to that when the words say what they say, and yet people push back and say, well, that's what you say, but I read it differently. How do you respond to that, Dr. Copan? Well, I'd certainly ask questions. Uh, Jesus often did that when he would uh, be, you know, he'd be asked questions. He'd often respond with questions and reply. Uh, but I think it's good to ask people, well, now, why is it that you would 
And it sounds like when you say that's your interpretation, it sounds like you're saying that I'm wrong. Uh, that it's not just a matter of opinion, uh, that you you think that my viewpoint is somehow defective and that you, uh, for that reason, are not embracing it. What is your view and why do you take that view? Uh, I'd like to hear your own uh, you know, take on this and, and why you think your position is justified. And so here we are able to bring it to the level of a truth claim, uh, a stance that someone is taking, rather than just, oh, I like you know, Ben and Jerry's New York super fudge chunk and you like Hagen dazs Swiss chocolate almond or something. Sure. Uh, it's not a matter of, you know, taste. Uh, you're, you're, you're angling uh, to make the point that you disagree with me and that's fine. Uh, but I want to know what your point of, your reason for disagreeing is. Uh, and so it can be brought to the level of truth rather than mere opinion or preference, I think fairly quickly. And of course, a lot of people don't want to get into a discussion about their interpretation, your interpretation. They just don't like your interpretation. And I think it's it's good to, through discussion, draw that out, that it's not really a matter of something perhaps one has thought through. It may just be something that a person doesn't like, and so therefore rejects it and then just uses that line, that's just your interpretation. And so it's good to, I think, gently kindly in a relationship to, to, to push back and say, you know, tell me what you mean. I mean, what is your interpretation uh, of this? Uh, and, you know, of course, if there's a better interpretation, I'd like to hear about it. I'd like to I want to make sure that I'm not interpreting something uh, incorrectly. Uh, but uh, but again, there's a limit to interpretations. Uh, and mm -hmm. so when we're, when we're talking about uh, how we interpret things, it's not as though this is just uh, you know, a toss-up or anyone's uh, just as right as anyone else, uh, that we are dealing with the realm of truth. We're dealing with the realm of uh, matching, you know, our, our ideas matching up with reality. And so I want to make sure that my ideas are matching up with reality rather than following something that is actually going to mislead me, mislead others as I communicate those ideas to them and so forth. So that's where I would go on, on that, uh, that, that line. That's just your interpretation. Uh, where can people find you online? Got a website, paulcopan.com. Uh, also, uh, if you're interested in the books that I've been working on, you can look at Amazon. And uh, if you want to come and study at Paul Beach Lang University, you've got a great master's uh, in, in philosophy of religion program, whether it's our hybrid distance learning program or uh, you want to join us uh, here in West Palm Beach. Sure, sure. Okay, well, give us a homework assignment for people that, that understand we're in a crisis of truth, in a world of opinion, they want to stand for truth. Uh, professor, give us a homework assignment. Well, a handy dandy homework assignment would be to take a look at my book, True For You, Not For Me, which is actually a guide to slogans that you commonly hear. Uh, you know, that's just your opinion or the like. And it guides you through, it looks at all the assumptions that are behind those slogans. And then at the end of each chapter, it gives a nice summary, uh, bullet points for each of those chapters. Uh, so hopefully that'll be a helpful, accessible guide for you. And uh, we'll begin there perhaps. Thank you so much for being with us today. Folks, thanks for watching. We're gonna continue our talk about truth and how to stand strong for it when we come back. Don't go away. I just returned from a conference at The Cove, and it was absolutely breathtaking in every way. The mountain views, the tranquil areas within the woods, and just being alone with God. Mornings spent watching the sunrise from a rocking chair with coffee in one hand and my Bible in the other. Evenings spent reflecting on the incredible spiritual teaching. It's the embodiment of peacefulness. Come and experience The Cove for yourself. God has shown us very clearly that each of us is accountable for what we do with truth. Hi, Alex McFarland here. Let me read something regarding truth and our relationship to it from the Word of God in Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, God really warns us. It says, but according to the hardness and impenitence of our heart, if we reject truth, says Romans 2, we are storing up wrath against ourselves for the day of judgment, God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Now listen to verse 7 of Romans 2. Eternal life to those who by patient 
continuance, do good, seeking for God's glory and immortality. All right, doing good, that's not works, but it's the, the thing that we're supposed to do. First John 4 says, this is the commandment of God to believe in Jesus Christ, his son, whom God hath sent. Now listen to verse 8. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, indignation and wrath. Listen, the wisest thing we could ever do is to admit that truth exists and I'm accountable to it. You know, Jordan Peterson, the famous intellectual, he recently told Pierce Morgan that we are a culture who tolerates lying leaders because we ourselves are so often liars. And totalitarianism and cultural decay is, is coming about before our very eyes because we have ceased to believe that truth matters. Please believe it. Truth matters. Truth is real and truth is important to each one of us. The first and most primary truth, of course, being that God loves us and Christ died for us. I hope you have put your faith in Jesus. I hope you have known the one who is truth and that we are committed to live for truth. The reason you want to come to Karis is because of the community and fellowship you get from everybody you're around. They focus on their relationship with God, which makes all their relationships here so powerful and just easy. And it is so cool because you can connect with anybody here. It's to disciple people, it's to see people grow. And you don't find it everywhere, but you will find it here. Wow, these are exciting days to know truth and to live truth and to stand for truth. This past summer, we did four different youth camps. We were in front of over 650 teenagers. And let me tell you, they're hungry for truth. That's why we've got the Viral Truth Campus Clubs. I want you to go to the website, viraltruth.com. And, you know, right now we're regularly doing Zoom calls with young people and we're equipping them to organize clubs that enable them to reach their teens for God and country. So check out the new website, viraltruth.com. And let me just say this, we couldn't do all that we do. This television program, events, conferences, radio, podcasts, camps, couldn't do it without the prayers and financial help of friends like you that believe that God and country are worth standing up for. So I've got a very important resource I want to send you. And it's, it's a little bit different, but if you would send a support gift of at least $40, I want to give you a very significant resource. It's called First Principles, what our founders learned from sources like the Bible and Aristotle. It really will help you understand our Constitution. This is an important resource, and we've acquired a quantity of these. If you would send a tax-deductible gift of at least $40, I'm going to send you the book, First Principles, to help you understand how to talk to others about our Judeo-Christian Republic. So please go to my website, which is alexmcfarland.com, or you can mail in a donation at the address on the screen. I do want to say how much I appreciate the wonderful people at the NRB Television Network for partnering with us to stand for God and country. And I thank you for partnering with us as well.